This week, our first repeat guest. We've had him on. He was episode three as we got fit with Dante Finney. How are you today, Dante? Man, feeling good, Earl. Thanks for bringing me back, buddy. Hey, I'm glad you were able to make the time to do this. I just wanted to talk to you about so many things that were going on. And normally we pre-record a lot of these episodes. And so around the time these episodes are recorded, a lot of things are going on. And sometimes it may not be as timely as they normally are. But there are a lot of big things going on that I wanted to talk to you about, especially with your background and personal training and personal fitness. And if we can go right into it, one of the biggest things I wanted to talk about, the University of Maryland Ooh. firing their coach, DJ Durkin, all the information, the investigation that came out about the possible toxic culture surrounding the death of former offensive lineman Jordan McNair. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts on that when you heard about everything that's going on, especially you being a native Marylander and then hearing the cause of what led to Jordan McNair dying? Yeah, when we first heard it, man, we, you know, a couple of people in the gym, we all talked about it. And it's amazing that you let something like that happen here in 2018, where we got all kinds of monitoring. They got heart rate monitors and all these different various testings the best hydration systems in the world are on the sidelines the best nutrition available before and after practices so with all these different things put in place you almost have to be a little you have to be careless to let something like this happen you got to be very careless so I feel as a, a university such as University of Maryland should have paid way more closer attention to detail and known this young man's background, as well as there was a few others who were just not up to par with the rest of the team, which is fine, but you got to work those people accordingly. With your experience as a personal trainer, how do you deal with making sure a client doesn't get overexerted, or how do you prevent overexertion? To prevent overexertion, you know, I can't lie, it's a lot of uh, science behind it because we do testing beforehand. We test maximal weight move. We test their cardio. We test their flexibility. So we make sure we keep movements inside of their range of motion. You want to do anything outside of the range of motion or too much weight. So the person's background is huge. So those first two weeks, you're just assessing, assessing, assessing to see how far can a person go. And then you want to work them around 75 to 80 percent of capacity with these various tests. But there's also an instinctive component to it. And it's not perfect. But when people do get tired, yes, I look at their eyes to see if they're focused. Are they looking at me or are they looking at me, right? In the martial arts fight world or in the boxing world, there's people that will be knocked out on their feet and they're looking at you, but they're not looking at you. They're looking through you. There's little signs like the flushing of the face. Is the face very white? Are the ears very white? When I see the ears getting very white, we know that blood is leaving the extremities and going to the core. Something wrong is happening. So there's a lot of instinctive cues as well that these people need to be aware of. Yeah, I know there was talk that he had an issue with hydration and they did not hydrate him in time. They did not call the ambulance in time. Hydration, I know hydration is definitely key to any type of physical activity. How do you try to regulate hydration, especially when you're working with your clients? So with my clients, obviously, it's a more one-on-one -on -one personalized setting post to the football field and football practice, where it's hard to tell 50 guys to drink water every 20 minutes. But you got to be aware of that. I mean, my clients are more than free to drink water every 10 to 20 minutes. I try to remind them as much as they can. It's funny. There's a little joke, you know, that sometimes, I, you know, after 20, 30 minutes, I'm like, oh, get a water break. I'm sorry. I, I push a little too hard sometimes. And this is just after 20 or 30 minutes. So you, you got to make sure you drink while you're working out and preferably hydrate 30 minutes before you start working out. But that's just something we monitor. We monitor, you know, how dry is your skin? How dry are your lips? How dry is your hair? All these things are just small indicators of total hydration. And we like to pay attention to them. If one thing is off, OK, but if you got two or three of these factors off, then we know the hydration is not there. You need to slow it down a little bit. But prevention is key, man. When it comes to hydration, what is the what should be the total daily allowance of water a person should get? I hear it varies. I've heard different things, especially some people say for weight loss, you drink maybe half your weight in ounces of water and things yep. like that. Mm -hmm. So many different cues you can use, and I would love to just give you a specific number. I actually have a formula that I run through that's about a three-part equation that we run through to find the hydration. 
But you really have to, as far as weight loss, you got to see what the person is drinking. If somebody is drinking two bottles of water and they come to me and I'm like, hey, you need to get up to a gallon. I need you drinking a gallon of water by next week. Look, guys, 90 percent of the time, it's not going to happen. You're not going to go from two bottles to a gallon. (laughs) Then you get discouraged. Then you want to back off and not even try. So here's the key, people. Find out what you're drinking now. Break it down. Is it two bottles a day? Is it three bottles a day? And then let's just add a bottle at a time. A bottle is typically 16.9 ounces, 17 to 20 ounces. So let's just build up that ladder slowly. At least give me 80 ounces, regardless of body weight, regardless of activity. Give me 80 ounces at first. Let's try to get there. Then after you get past the 80 ounce mark, then you can start being more specific on your your needs and you can talk to someone that in the future but at first just find out where you're at and then build up don't try to just jump to a gallon if you're only drinking two bottles a day biggest thing was when i was at work i would take a gallon of water every day and drink that sometimes i'd get through the whole gallon and other times i'd maybe have like a fourth of it to go or depending on that but that really is something you have to work your way up you can't just start drinking a ton of water without at least building that up yeah, you got to build it up. Sometimes a lot of people's bodies doesn't process the water as fast. Some people can just drink, 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 and they're fine. And some people drink a little bit and they have the sloshing effect in their belly for hours, you know, or at least for 20 or 30 minutes. So you got to be aware of how your body is absorbing the water in your metabolism or even how much you sweat. Some people don't sweat as much as others. Some people barely move and sweat a ton. Then you know you need to drink more. But I think the whole point is find out where you're at now and then build up slowly into something that's going to be sustainable and good for your health. As we bring this back towards that whole situation at the University of Maryland and the Jordan McNair tragedy, uh, do you think the decision Mm -hmm. was right for them to bring Durkin back before firing him? Or do you feel like they should have just let him go beforehand? Obviously, just let him go. But that's not how it works right now. You know, we got the whole Ohio State Coach Meyer thing to kind of look at with that. Doesn't matter how bad things are. They got to bring them back to kind of make everybody, you know, seem okay, give everybody a fair shot and all those types of things. But let's be real, that guy should be gone. You can't monitor a college team to the point where you got someone dying on the field. You got to go. I mean, there's no there's no room for that. There's no room for that. And this was not like. You know, there's been people pass out in large hearts. Okay, you're not going to know somebody has an enlarged heart. All right, those things may happen. But if it's all the hydration and fatigue or too many days in a row of long workouts, I think the workouts were longer than regulation. Uh, When you're doing things like that and people are dying, you got to go. And I think about, while it's semi-related, McNair apparently did a lot of running that day. And I always go back to the time Albert Hainsworth was with the Redskins and sort of as punishment, Mike Shanahan made him run the gassers in quick succession for Hainsworth, a guy who's a professional athlete, 300 some odd pounds and things like that. Uh-huh. It's far different as opposed to a 19-year-old under a college environment where things are sometimes seen to be a little less regulated and overseen. Yeah, and that's purely because of numbers. I mean, think about how many colleges have to be watched. So, you know, you can sneak things under the radar here and there, man. So that's why you need super responsible people at the top, man. I mean, you don't have to win every year, but you can't put people in danger. And it is interesting how they brought him back. And real quick, let's remember, it's not just about this one person. For lack of a better term, they say it was what a culture of fear, you know, that was being established there. So these kids didn't even feel like they could stand up for themselves because they've been essentially bullied, right, to the point where they're going to do anything this man asks, even when they know it's not right, ethically right, physically right. You know, they're not allowed to question it. There's something wrong with that, too. You know, I don't think athletes should be able to question everything their coach does. But if it seems beyond the limits of what you can do, you need to be able to have the right stuff. You said it goes back to coaching. Who would you say has been one of the best coaches that you've ever had? Oh, man. One of the best coaches I ever had would have to be maybe not the best, but the most long lasting influence on me would definitely be Eric Evans, my karate teacher, you know, second man at our school. Very influential because not just through martial arts, but also in life, the way he carried himself, his swagger, you know, his hustle, these different things also rubbed off on me, was also a huge impact. 
And I think that's what a good coach does, right? A good coach is not just going to influence you in your sport, but in life as well. And that's how you know that's a mark of a great coach. Wow. That is something in my mind that definitely yeah. definitely you feel like a lot of coaches just say enough to get you and with their charisma, then after that, maybe don't care about you as much as once you're on mm-hmm. the team or once you're in that squad. Yep, and, and we see it a lot in the personal training field. You have people that go in, they run your numbers, they give you your workout, and that's it. You talk to them maybe two hours a week, three hours a week, and that's all you get. And that's okay in a lot of instances. But we really try to focus on talking to these people every day or every other day minimum because – Two hours worth of workouts is not going to change their life. Two or three hours worth of working out is not going to get you to lose 80 pounds. It's the small decisions every day. Can I influence you to make the right decisions every day? When you drive by McDonald's or Salad Works, which one are you going to go to? You know, can I influence you to make that right decision? So those in-between times really matter. Relationship stress. You have to be aware of things like this. You can train somebody as hard as you want, but if it ain't going right at home, the whole process isn't going to go right. So you have to be aware and, and help these people through these things. And at least if you can't help them, get them to the right people that can be that coach that they need. I know we were just talking about definitely food choices and things like that. And you know me, you've seen a lot of my Instagram. I, I'm a person that likes making food at home as opposed to going out. Yeah, and the wings and the ribs look good. <laughs> mm-hmm. The biggest thing is, the biggest thing I try, especially when you buy stuff, and I know in this world of bulk packages and buying stuff like that, it's trying to make good portions of food at home without having to worry about overindulging. What do you think is a big key to that, especially for someone who cooks at home? Well, first of all, congratulations for cooking at home, number one, because no matter how much, and, and I'm a little reluctant to say that, but no matter how much salt and sugar you add to your food at home, it does not compare to what they add to it in the restaurant. Uh, my wife and I both worked in the restaurant business for six, seven years. And it's, and trust me, we've seen it. You, <laughs> no matter how much salt and sugar you put in it, you're not touching what these restaurants do. That's number one. Number two, man, you, you saw portion control, but portion control is tough. It really is. So sometimes you just got to focus on an item. Um, here in 2018, the most successful strategy has been remove one thing. So if you know potatoes is an issue for you, remove potatoes from dinner, eat them at lunch or remove it from lunch and only at dinner, whatever. Remove one thing. So in other words, instead of saying, well, I'm going to cut my steak in half, I'm going to cut my potato in half, and I'm going to cut my macaroni and cheese in half, let's just totally eliminate one. Let's just take one out, have whatever you want for the rest of them. Let's just make a habit to do that one thing. You know, you got to make these goals a little smaller these days because we got so many different other things going on. Let's keep our diet real simple. So, and that's going to control your portion size, right? I mean, the chances of you taking out your potato and then doubling up on your mac and cheese, it's not going to happen. You're going to be conscious at that point of what you're doing. So let's just take one thing out and that's going to help you a lot. And one thing I've been doing, I know it can be tough, as you mentioned, but baked potatoes and macaroni, I look at it as, man, that's double starch. And I try to oh, yeah. on that and try to do one green vegetable. And if I'm going to do a starch, do that with the meat. And uh-huh. I, like, for example, someone will say, oh, let's have baked potato with corn and, and, you know, whatever, chicken or beef or whatever. And the biggest thing is, to me, mm-hmm. corn's a starch, too. To me, corn is a starch, so I feel like it's better off if I'm going to do oh, yeah. to broccoli peas or lima beans or something like that it's something green yeah in our personal my personal opinion corn is the worst the most useless food out there that we eat every day it's the most useless thing there's nothing in it that's going to help you do anything productive in life except take a nap really that's it that corn is no good when it comes to proteins i know I always have seen a lot of people when it comes to protein sort of shy away a little more from pork than opposed to maybe like beef or chicken or turkey or, or mm-hmm. other more expensive cuts like lamb and things like that. What are your thoughts on pork? <laughs> That's crazy. A couple of Christmases ago, my grandfather, we were talking about eating bacon or some type of pork. And he said, you know, this guy's in his late 80s now. He said, do you know what the hog eat? Because you know you are what you eat. Do you know what the hog eat? 
And we were like, dang, that's a good point. That's all he said. But so to get to the point is it's like chickens and stuff, they're eating grains and bugs and cows, they're eating their grains and grass and whatnot. Pigs will eat anything dead that pops in their pig pen. Anything, any leftover meats, food, dead animals, all that stuff is getting fed to the pork, man. So you are in result eating what they eat. And that's just not good. The pig will eat anything. I can't even remember the exact minutes or whatever, but if you put a human body in a pig pen, it will be gone within an hour. Like they will eat anything, dog. So keep that in mind when you're eating the pork. Now, do I eat some pork? Yes, love bacon. But keep that in mind. You're not only what you eat, you're what the animal you eat eats. I always go back to, yeah, Pulp Fiction. I go back to Pulp Fiction where John Travolta and Samuel Jackson like, why don't you like bacon on your burger? It's like, man, pigs are unclean along those lines like that. I mean, and you hear some people talk about it for religious reasons. Yeah. Which I won't go on that. Hey, people have their own choices. Yeah. And I was looking at one mm-hmm. time, I had switched out from regular bacon to turkey bacon for a point. One of the things I saw, of course, turkey mm-hmm. bacon had higher sodium count. And that was one of the things that sort of shied me away from it. Just to make it taste better. Oh, yeah. And if you get the wrong type of turkey bacon, which could be awful, it all depends on the brand you get as well, because not every turkey bacon is going to be great. You get me Butterball or some other name brand that's great. Give me Jenny O, it's awful. Jenny O turkey bacon. Jenny O. (laughs) You get what you pay for sometimes, huh? Yeah. I've actually, I've had this recent psychological block, and I notice this happened a lot more. So okay. I'm a big fan of meatballs. I like meatballs. But now I have this metal block where if it's not like 100% beef or it's mixed with turkey or chicken or something, I won't eat it. I just can't get it past my head where I was like, yeah, ground turkey. Because I've had some times I tried to make a hybrid meatloaf with beef and ground turkey, and it didn't taste well. I can't eat turkey meatloaf. I used to love eating uh, ground chicken meatballs balls from this Indian restaurant in Salisbury. I tried making chicken meatballs at home. It, it's mm-hmm. good. It looked good. My wife loved them. I could not even get past the first bite. It was like chewing. It didn't have that feel like beef meatball. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So consistency of the meat got you messed up, man. You addicted to that fat, my man. I don't know. It just felt so grainy, but it's weird. I can still eat chicken off the bone, chicken breast, things like that. But it just, when it comes to a meatball, it's like completely... Yeah. When they, when you ground the chicken, it takes a lot of the fat and the moisture out of it. It's in there, but through processing, it loses flavor. You know, through the processing, it loses flavor. So it's that simple, man. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Look at you. Can't eat that ground chicken, huh? It's all good. I was, and I was so crying. Good. And the sad thing, I was looking forward to it. It's not like, ah, I'm just like, I'm going in clear mind. And it's like, it started like it was ground turkey. And I say this, I'm an advocate of turkey. And even then I'm sort of iffy with turkey. I'll eat Thanksgiving type turkey, but I'm not a fan of turkey wings, turkey drumsticks. Yeah, it has to be sort of like in a Thanksgiving setting or something like that. Or how it's yeah. season and things yeah. like that. Way beyond it. Yeah. And I don't <laughs> know what's going on. And it's like, I haven't had this issue before. I don't know, but just some type of mental yeah. problem. Well, the chicken... That, that turkey bacon got you. The ground turkey, that's always been bad. I, my sister-in-law made a uh, turkey meatloaf, and I kept trying to chew, kept trying to chew, kept trying to chew, could not swallow it, and I couldn't. And it was just, yeah, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, it was- yeah, I mean, you know, food is all about taste at the end of the day. So you, if you can't, you know, get down with it on a level of taste, it's hard to keep repeating it. What are your thoughts on duck as a meat and taste wise? Man, I've never fully dove into the duck conversation, so this will be a first. As far as taste, is great. I mean, it's got that good, that little fatty feel to it that the turkey's missing, that's for sure. As far as protein to fat content, though, I'm actually not sure, my friend. I would have to look that up. But it's got to be better option than a lot of your beef or pork, so, you know. Because once again, we're talking about, you know, how natural fed is it is number one. So if it's eating bugs and grass off the ground, it's keeping it natural. I'm sure it's a fantastic product. What are your thoughts on free range and organic meats? Do you eat a lot of those? Yep. Yeah, man, this debate has been going on and on. And I can't lie, you know, some months I'm like, it doesn't matter. The difference is so small, it doesn't matter. And then some months it's like, woo, it really, really matters. At the end of the day, when you look at the data, you talk to the people that actually eat, you know, organic it matters. It matters big time. And this is what you're looking for. You're looking for 
100% free range, all right? We're not going to get into too many chemical names because they're too big for me to pronounce. But with chickens that eat 100% free range, no grains, do not gain a specific protein that we are super allergic to that is super inflammatory to the human system. Chickens that eat grains and are not free range are loaded with this particular protein that causes lots of inflammation inside the human body. And that's where we're starting to have a problem because 100 years ago or even less, 60 years ago, most chicken, they ate bugs and grass. So they were fine. Then they switched to grains and they developed this protein that is super inflammatory inside the human body. So free range foods are key, but you have to watch out, Earl, because they can label their food free range and the doors for the chicken coop only have to be open for 10 minutes. And within this 10 minutes, most of the chickens don't even make it out of the coop because it's so crowded. They just stand there. They don't force their way through the chickens to get outside. The door has to be open for 10 minutes for it to be qualified as free range. The chicken may never even go outside. So if you're going to do it, don't just look for free range. 100% free range. That's how you know they've been outside for a sufficient amount of time and they're not fed heavy greens. Big difference. And it's crazy to think about just all those chickens in the chicken houses just sort of cooped up like that. And I think mm-hmm. being a chicken in a chicken coop, the only thing I can think is worse is to being the person that has to catch the chickens. Yeah, I know, right? My dad used to catch chickens when he used to work at Holly Farms and Tyson. Mm-hmm. I just can't imagine. I mean, it's nothing like, I assume it's far different from what you see in Rocky with Sylvester Stallone trying to chase after the chicken while he's yeah. yelling at him. But I, I just can't imagine that, what it was like. I'll admit, I'm a person that's not geared towards a lot of physical work. <laughs> I, I'll admit that. Yeah. Before, but I just can't imagine right, right. having to do that. I mean, the physical work, you know, obviously, you know, it's all good, man. But the health impact? That's horrible to be in that type of atmosphere for hours and hours a day, man. Cannot be good. But you got to do what you got to do sometimes, you know? So so be careful when you're eating your meats, man. Organic is the word. Really look into it. Make sure you're 100% free range or no grains fed. You're looking for that type of label. For sure, man. Just asking your preference. What do you prefer more, lamb or bison or buffalo? Lamb or bison. I haven't had very much bison. Um, but if I had to pick, we got the lamb. Lamb is good, bro. We got to go with the lamb. Roast that thing up, a little curry style type thing going on. And I think especially watching a lot of these, that's another thing I do. I watch a lot of the cooking shows like Master Chef, and uh, I don't really watch Hell's Kitchen as much anymore. Gordon Ramsay basically is rent-free on Fox. He has all these shows. Yeah, he got that all locked down. Yeah, yeah, like they do, like the lollipop lambs. I just can't imagine. I mean, I know food prep, and that's a lot of stuff that goes into it, especially, you know, you got to get yes. certain things ready for it, seasoning and, and stuff like that. But yeah, like I said, seeing how they do like the lollipop lamb chops and things like that, it's a lot of work. When you, oh, yeah. When you're prepping your creator, it's like, man, do you really want to eat it after that then? It's like, it's art. <laughs> eat something that you just made it feels like you put all this work into it and then now it's going to he made it he made it for somebody else you typically when we cook it for ourselves we don't get that fancy i mean plating is important i'll plate my family's food like restaurant plating like clean edges and i'll just throw mine on just like this slop in a prison yard or something you know old cafeteria lady did it you know i'm not worried about presentation very much i'm just trying to eat it at that point yeah, and even when I do like the Instagram photos, I don't focus that much on plating. Especially, I know like my wife, she doesn't like a lot of her foods touching. If, for example, if you have rice and then if you have black beans or something like that, maybe you don't want the black beans touching the rice. Maybe you just want to clean. <laughs> There's people like that, right? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just like I said, it's all about who likes plating. Everybody likes good plating, my friend. Everybody likes some good plating. It matters, man. It matters on the taste. You taste differently depending on how it's presented to you. After we talked about the lamb and bison. Sort of I know. We up here talking about food. Got me <laughs> hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry as well. I know that's a habit I need to do is trying to eat a little more breakfast because sometimes getting up early and it's like, especially now, we just talked about all types of pork byproducts. <laughs> that might change. Yeah. <laughs> That might change a lot of how you eat. And I think a lot of things are good in moderation. I think that's the big key. And we discussed that last time. Moderation is the key. Like, for example, 
yeah, if you're going to get a couple sausage links or a couple pieces of bacon, that's cool. But you don't need 20 sausage links and like 30 pieces of bacon. Or 20 days in a row of just two slices. And that's the biggest thing, trying to mix that up. Like I said, eggs, I don't see. Have you tried to drink the eggs raw like Rocky did? I know we're going to referring a lot. Oh, yeah, man. Rocky, yeah, for sure. Either or. I just can't do it. I'm very skittish with eggs, and I mentioned that last time we talked. I have to have them scrambled. I've tried fried egg. Maybe it's a texture thing sometimes. Not too fond of the yolk, huh? Yeah, just never have been, and it's just like... I tried. No, that's so hard when you got to get past it visually. You got to get past the consistency. It's a lot going to the yolk, but don't hate on the yolk. The yolk contains valuable cholesterol that gets converted into hormones like testosterone. So don't be afraid of the yolk. Definitely not afraid of the yolk. It's just how to cook it. That, for me, is the biggest thing. Now, I know when we were in high school, you were definitely a big fan of Superman. Yes, sir. I assume that you watched lot of the Superman movies and everything that's come out. Yeah, I definitely caught a few. What was your favorite Superman movie, if there was one? Oh, man. Now, as far as one particular movie, I don't really think I have one like that. I mean, as far as actors, you know, you can't be Christopher Reeve. Uh, the new boy, Henry. The new joint's real hot, too. I like that one a lot. But that's about, yeah, I guess, I guess those are about the only two that really stand out like that. Everybody know Dean Cain, but that was like a drama type of Superman, right? The more relationship based and all that type of thing. Yeah, I think a little more lighter hearted, I guess, as opposed to more light hearted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. So, uh, you know, I think they might have played with him a little too much, you know. But of course, who we said it was? George Reeves? Yeah, George Reeves was the one of the yeah. one on TV in the, in the 50s. Hard to top the originals, man. It's always hard to top the originals. Yeah, I remember first watching those episodes with George Reeves on Nick at Night. And I had to be like it's the early 90s, so about nine or ten. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. You will watch them shoot him with a gun, and then they'll throw the gun and he'll duck it. So if you're the man of steel, gunshots don't work, but throwing the gun at his head. But throw the gun at him. Wow. Yeah. TV yeah. is something else. Yeah, especially back then, especially when there weren't as many special effects. And uh, I feel like, do you feel like movies have gone too special effects heavy? A hundred percent sure. I used dropped on a conversation in the gym last week. They were talking about, yeah, yeah, man, it takes a lot of the, yo, that could actually happen out of it. You know, when it's way out there, when the special effects are so crisp. So it's tough. And, you know, they were talking about where the special effects, even the, the quality is so good now, you almost notice more flaws in the movies because you can see everything. So you notice when the acting's bad or a color is off or a scene is just not right. Whereas when everything wasn't so perfect, it, it kind of flowed together more. And all the bad things didn't stand out. Yeah. And especially now to the point where sometimes it's like if a movie is like 90% CG, it really takes any bit of realism out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Could this really happen? Right. We were lucky to have movies where Jackie Chan would do his own stunts or other particular actors would do their own stunts. I don't know if you ever watched the show The Rockford Files mm -hmm. with James Garner. No. But apparently he played it private eye on and he would basically do all his own stunts. Okay. It got to the point where he kept getting hurt to the point where they'd have to push seasons back because he was recovering from doing all his own stunts. Older guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Played, he was the original Maverick. Yeah, in the West. Okay, all right, right. I'm trying to think what other movies. He, well, he was, I don't know if you've seen The Notebook, but he played the older version of Ryan Gosling's character in The Notebook. No, I definitely didn't see that. It's like that. But James Garner, he was in a lot of stuff. And definitely. just knowing that makes you want to respect it so much more, right? And it's just, man... He think, and he's doing this was a weekly TV show. You know, back in the 70s, they were probably doing a ton more episodes than they were doing now than like the normal 22 to 24. They were probably doing like 30 mm -hmm. episodes a season. To do this nonstop for a TV show in and out for seven or eight years, the only reason the show got canceled is because he was recovering, I think, from another injury and the network or either Universal or whatever network wanted to cancel it. And he wanted to come back. But yeah, that was a whole mess. Uh, Too much of a daredevil. <laughs> yeah, and he was, I think he was probably like in his 50s by then. Mm. But yeah, I'm trying to think of what other movies he, he's been in that you probably would have seen. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I bet you see a picture of James Garner, you know who he is. Okay. I can kind of picture it now that you said all that, but I have to look him up real quick. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. You know, it, just, it was a lot more exciting like when the movies like that, a lot more exciting. 
make you want to go try some things too. If you can't get backyard and try stunts, it's a little, you know, not quite as exciting either, right? We like to look at stuff like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah, that was most of our childhood. We'd grow up, would go outside, play Power Rangers or whatever superhero of the day was. Mm-hmm. And, and right. That was probably one of the most exciting things in the world. Mm-hmm. Yep, trying to do these stunts was amazing. The Jackie Chan running up the wall, trying to do all these different things. And I know that you also had a chance to do some MMA fighting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What is that experience like? I know that's something we definitely want to touch on a lot more in depth in another episode, but definitely what was that experience like and what's the training that goes into that? Man, MMA training. Okay, so awesome experience being in the cage, super, super exhilarating. Um, Definitely do it, but the real key is the training camp. Like you said, the preparation behind that is amazing. You want to have an eight, 12 week camp, sometimes 16 weeks to really make sure everything is is sharp and heightened at the time of the fight. You know, you want to peak too early or you don't want to peak too late. You know, some people are in better shape after the fight than they are before the fight because they just peak too late. So timing is huge. But what you got to go through is crazy, man. Things have changed a lot. It used to be a brutal three, two hour sessions a day, three, three hour sessions a day, sparring every day. Um, now people have backed off of the time that they train, the amount of sparring they do because of injuries. People were just, you know, the chances of going into an MMA fight with no injuries is super rare, super rare. My second fight, I had a hundred degree temperature going into the cage, which is probably not the safest thing, but it happened. So the preparation is huge. A lot of hours, a um, lot of watching your diet, and the skills of these people nowadays is amazing. Um, when I fought just, what, eight years ago or so, people really were good at one thing. You know, people were good strikers. People were good wrestlers. People were good at kicks. People were good at punches. These new cats good at all of it. They can do everything. You got there swinging and punching and knocking McGregor down. McGregor's the best striker. He getting knocked down by a wrestler. So there's a lot of things that changed, and it's a lot to really uh, get into, man. You got to be ready. You got to be ready to dedicate yourself. And while I've tried to watch mixed martial arts, the biggest thing I prefer is like the more of the striking aspect, the punching and things like that that you would find in boxing. Right. And even having experience wrestling, even though it wasn't very long, I definitely understand the importance of having a good ground game. But to me, right. I just prefer the flurries that you would see in boxing. And I feel like yeah. and I feel like that's what. It makes it tough to watch an MMA fight for me sometimes. I mean, I prefer the boxing matches. Right. The swings and misses and swinging and connecting is super exciting. You know, it's grappling. It's no real excitement yet until the actual submission gets applied. So it definitely makes it hard to watch in that aspect. But when you're talking about longevity or even just a real street fight, to be honest, if somebody walked in your home and was trying to take your family out, if I could get behind him and choke him unconscious, I would love to do that as opposed to swinging and missing 10 times. So, you know, you got to find what's good for you. But as far as longevity, if you can take some out and choke him out and not take hits, you're going to survive a lot longer. And that puncher's chance is real. Oh, yeah. It happens to even the better fighters. And mm-hmm. one thing is, I feel like in mixed martial arts, a loss isn't as damning as it would be in boxing especially an early loss. No, not at all. Not at all. Because it's such a tough sport, such a diverse sport. I mean, people should almost fight three, four times to really find out who the better person is because, you know, with so many elements, if, you know, Jose Aldo against Connor and Connor knocks him out in a few seconds, you want to run that back again because, like, that was kind of luck. You know, I didn't get a chance for both people to show their skills. That's like if you start a basketball game and say first three-pointer wins, and Curry goes and shoots a three-pointer and makes it and the game's over. You're like, hold on, what happened to the rest of the match? That's kind of how MMA is. It's like the fights be over in a minute. And you're like, hold on, I didn't get to display my skills, you know. So in that aspect, it's really tough. You gotta expect people to lose. You gotta expect people to lose because it's so hard. Boxing's so honestly watered down, you can pick 50 opponents that you know you can beat and go 50 and 0. <clears throat> I know somebody that might have done that before. 
Well, in his case, and if you add the big show, that's 51 and 0. <laughs> he's 51 and 0. He won. Yeah, in, true, true. He won, in a, he won in a scripted match. He's won against an MMA fighter, and he's won against other guys. I mean, he watched He that carefully fight. picked his exciting. opponents. The fight was exciting with him and Connor. Yeah, yeah, very. I remember watching Very that. entertaining. I was watching a fight on somebody's Periscope on Twitter because I'm, I'm not going to pay for it. No. <laughs> no. Nothing's worth being paid for anymore. Like I said, the best thing about YouTube is you can go back and watch Mike Tyson knock out 15 people in like three minutes. In three minutes. Yeah, that's yeah, that is so true. The yeah. thing about the Connor fight is Connor is actually a true fighter. I mean, and I'm not even, a, I was not a Connor fan, but I can't knock greatness. Uh, but I wasn't even the biggest Connor fan at all. Not even close. But you got to respect the fact that that man is a real fighter. And um, he gave the best a little trouble. Just a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. So much respect, man, that he made that a, a real fight. The biggest gripe with boxing to me is judging. Yeah. And I know that a lot of people say, oh, this person won this match. I know that there are four particular criteria on judging a boxing match that a lot of people don't look at anymore. And I always... Uh, keep looking up and i always keep forgetting i know no. one is being a good ring general that's one of the biggest things uh clean yeah ring command yep god there's so much that there yeah, there's a lot i mean you got damage delivered damage delivered how much damage did you take uh ring control is huge uh especially in mma if you if you're just on top of somebody and not hitting them you will win the round i could be on the bottom and hit you 10 times you could be on top and hit him once, and you'll win simply because you have the ring control. Boxing is kind of the same way. But they focus on who takes the center of the ring and who has their back on the ropes the most. So if your back's on the ropes a lot, there's a chance you may lose that round, you know? Yeah, because I always look at it before I knew the four criteria, and that's something that's still tough, is just trying to – you'll see somebody, somebody get good shots – even though they're throwing a ton of them and their punch landed percentage probably isn't as good as the many punches they threw, you're going to think, right. man, he won this round, as opposed to something like, well, the shots weren't clean, he blocked better, uh, he right. blocked the ring a lot more. And I'm believe me, I am far from an expert in this. I, I still look it up constantly. I haven't lost a really good boxing match in a long time, other than probably the last boxing match I saw might have been Connor and Floyd. I mean, uh, I don't. After cutting the cord a little, I don't have HBO as much, and they aren't doing much boxing anymore either. But, yeah, that's one of the things. It, I feel like watching a good boxing match, maybe I'll get into it. I don't know. It's like I remember one time one of those Fernando Guerrero fights in Salisbury. After everybody left, we uh -huh. moved down to the ring where the seats, because they were empty. And, we, and you could just hear the shots. It's like you expect, and I keep using this reference, Rocky, as he's punching that big cow carcass. And it's like you could just hear Yeah, it. yeah, hitting the, the, the meat joint. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating sound. And it's a different sound, too, because, you know, when you fight for a, quite a bit of time, you get to learn to distinguish the difference. Some of the loudest ones is like this loud slap. You know, this loud slapping sound. And the crowd is always like, ooh, but that's usually not even the one that hurts. It's them thuds, man. It's that deep that sounds like you're hitting that meat, man. That's the ones that hurt. That loud slap, usually nothing, usually all, all for show. But that meat thud sound, that's the go right there. Yeah, I think that's one of the fascinating things about the sport of boxing, just especially when you're more closer and you hear the sounds. I feel like sounds can really enhance any sport. It's just like if I'm listening mm -hmm. to a baseball game on the radio, when you hear the sound of the bat being dropped or the bat like someone is in the batter circle and you can hear that sound of the donut coming off the bat hitting the ground. It's just something really yeah. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it gets you involved or like a good slam in MMA when that slam and they slam on the ground and, and it's that loud boom, it's that crashing noise and everybody tends to wake up a little bit, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, one thing yeah. I wanted to talk to you about, especially I know we talked about fitness and eating things. How do you deal with people who have particular food allergies, for example, like peanuts and other types of fruits and things like that. How do you try to cater a meal plan towards someone who has particular allergies? Right. Uh, and that's awesome that you brought that up. There's a specific book that I would recommend anyone with any type of allergies, uh, any celiac disease, basically any type of internal inflammation. 
There's a book called Plant Paradox by Dr. Gundry, G-U-N-D-R-Y. I'll double check that. But this gentleman, he has discovered something called lectins. And we're going to keep it real simple, but lectins are proteins that plants have that poison things that try to eat them. For instance, a cabbage has a particular lectin that when insects bite it, it poisons the insect so that the insect does not take a second bite. It's the way that plants defend themselves. Much like animals have venom and bright colors and these different things to ward off uh, attacks, plants have lectins, these poisonous proteins. So those are the things that we're usually allergic to. The way we deal with it is a lot of times, once again, for my more busy weight loss clients, you know, they got kids, they got a job, they got all these different things to focus on. We just try to remove one thing at a time. Things popular we like to remove is, once again, I have to say cheese, because people's dairy tolerance is usually very low, way lower than they think. I've had, you know, quote unquote, skinny people, a girl, she was in college, probably 115 pounds, but would be bloated a lot. Remove dairy from her diet, boom, the bloating was gone. So try to remove one thing at a time that you think you're allergic to. Because what happens is, if you remove too many things at one time, you don't know what you're actually allergic to. So remove one thing at a time and see what triggers. Or you can do the opposite. Remove the nuts, cheese, beans, these types of things. And then if your allergens go away, good. Introduce things one at a time back into your diet. And if any one particular thing makes you inflamed, throw it away. If it does not, keep it in the diet. Like, for example, I'll use it for example. My wife... She has an allergy to a lot of foods, bananas, uh, some oh, okay. berries, strawberries, things like that. She's okay around watermelon. So she's had her test. And it's sort of difficult when you're in a situation where I can eat bananas, no issue. But even it being around her, it being right, the smell of it just sort of starts giving her hives and things like that. It's sort of... Mm. What do you do with something like that? I mean, I know there's ways to replace potassium, for example, spinach and right. beets or other things. But uh, I mean, right. I haven't really tried beets and things like that, but spinach and, and other things. But what do you do in a situation like that where there, it could be yeah. you know, or cause you to bust out in the hives just being around it? Right. And, and there's, there's several people right now that we talk to that are dealing with that. And it's tough. You got to be mindful. Nutrition has now moved up the ladder in priority for you. Where you're going out to eat and things like that, you usually dictate on price or taste. Now you need to start dictating on content. It just takes the next level of detail. There's no cheating or getting around it. And there was a lady who was allergic, who has celiac disease, one of the first people, you know, it really affected her. And she knew that breaded chicken wings and pizza made her sick. I like ER sick. But for some reason, every two months or so, she would indulge and eat them anyway. we got to be smart. You know, our bodies have all developed a certain way. Uh, we haven't really discovered a way to revert being allergic to certain foods. You just have to be mindful of content and really eliminate those things. She's going to have to find another treat, something else that satisfies her sweet tooth or her lack of potassium besides the banana. And there's plenty of different options. You just got to do the research. What are your thoughts on vitamins? Do you feel that everybody gets a little bit obsessed with vitamins? <sighs> so many ways to look at this, but we'll start from the top. Some of the best doctors, the most trusted nutritionists in the world usually say that taking supplements is a waste. So you're basically peeing money. You're peeing money out because you can take a lot of these things, but the rate of digestion is very, very low. The rate of absorption is very low with so many supplements. Uh, now they have micronized nutrition where the supplements are broken down. It's so small and it's such fine compounds that we can absorb them better. So micronized nutrition is the future. But in general, do not focus on your supplements. And that's hard for me to say because I sell supplements, you know, but it's the truth. Don't focus on your supplements. Get your things from whole foods. Now, here's the difficult part. Our whole foods do not contain enough nutrients to fully support our daily lives. The orange from the 60s contains as much vitamins and nutrients as four to five oranges of today. Yes, you need four to five oranges from today than you need from 1960 to get the same nutrient content. So it's a really a double-edged sword. So when you're taking these supplements and vitamins, don't expect this miraculous change. 
But if you're not eating enough greens, you're not eating enough orange fruits, you're not eating enough red, then supplementing may be something for you. I know that was a confusing answer, but it's a confusing topic. So, yes, what you take is likely going to get peed out, but your whole foods are also not going to give you exactly what you need. And that includes things like multivitamins, someone that will take a, like a one a day or central. Yeah, especially, yeah, mostly speaking on multivitamins, yes. Yeah, because I sometimes... Yep, yep. We'll take stuff like flaxseed, fish oil, vitamin C, and things like that. Yep. Fish oil has a high rate of absorption across the board. People have done really well with developing the fish oils now, so usually you can't go wrong with that. But once again, I have to say you kind of get what you pay for as well, so keep that in mind. And another thing that people can sometimes get a little caught up on are calories. And I know calories are big, and I even look at it, but not all calories are created equal. Some foods that have maybe are higher in calorie content have higher in protein, higher in, in good fats. Like, for example, mm -hmm. you can, one of the things I tend to do, I haven't done in a while, I would go to Wawa, I would get a burrito bowl. All I would get is a steak burrito bowl, black beans, some salsa, and avocado. That's 400 mm -hmm. calories. But there's at least a lot of good fiber in it. There's a lot of protein. There's a lot of good fats in it. And I right. feel like sometimes people tend to get caught up on just seeing the calories and not looking at everything beyond that. That's correct. A lot of calorie counters traditionally believe that all calories are the same. And the truth is they're just not. If you look at it at a chemical level, they're not. I mean, there's a lot of things that are, but there's most of the time it's not the same. And yes, if you're looking at calories, are you looking at the carb to protein to fat ratio? Because that's what's really important. If you have a meal that's kind of low in calories, it's mostly protein and low carbs, you're probably pretty good. And even the opposite, if it's a little high on calories, but your protein to carb ratio is good, then it's probably an okay meal. So do don't get too focused on the calories. What are your thoughts on, I know there's always been the discussion about grains, darker grains versus whiter grains. Like they always said, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead and things like that. What are your thoughts on those? I'm going to pick the um, standpoint from the plant paradox for this conversation right now. You know, and I admit, I believe I was wrong. Of course, I was just like all the other fitness people, even people currently. Um, we're thinking that brown was the best. Eating the bran, eating the brown rice, eating the whole wheats and things like that was the best thing to do. And yes, the bran and the brown and the wheat, the whole wheats contain more nutrients than the white rice or the white pasta. But it's crazy. Now we're finding out the lectins in the bran, in the whole wheat are causing a lot of inflammation. And after hearing this, I'm like, okay, everybody has their own opinion. But then I look back and look at all my vegan clients. My vegan clients tend to be, for a lack of a better term, fluffier, less toned than the other clients. They eat less calories. They eat less processed food sometimes, but they tend to be bloated. Why? The brown rice, the brown wheat and stuff makes them bloated. So then I look back even further into history. This is going to be interesting, Earl. Check this out. Back in, I don't want to put a specific date on it, but back in the days of kings and queens and peasants and royalty, that type of thing, 1500s or so. Do you know that the kings and queens ate white bread and gave the brown, the whole wheat stuff to the peasants because the white bread was easier on their stomachs. It was easier to digest. So they kept those things and gave the unprocessed foods to the peasants. Let's look at our Asian cultures. All of our Asians eat what? White rice. They all eat white rice. They strip the bran off and eat white rice. So I looked into that and I'm like, why? Well, they also found that the white rice was easier to digest. They could eat more of it than the rice. So you tie that into the lectin speech. Then you start thinking, man, maybe removing these brands and this the brown off of these things is actually healthier for us. A lot of our bodies have not developed enough to be able to eat whole wheat. Whole wheat is actually very new to the human species as related to veggies and meat. We've been able to process veggies and meat for a lot longer than we've been trying to process whole wheat. Sometimes it's tough going with the brown stuff, man. I don't think it digests well for a lot of people. I myself have found that white rice is my best friend. Love the white rice over top of whole wheat bread or whole wheat pasta. So once again, you might want to get an allergy test to see where you stand on that scale and then have a mixture of both. I wouldn't go too far on the white or too far on the brown. Maybe mix it up if you're not finding that either one's hurting you. Make yeah. sense? 
Oh, yeah, it makes sense. Because honestly, you know, when you get scared into that whole thing, like, oh, eating more processed bread and grains could lead to a reduced lifespan, all of a sudden you start going the other way with things like that. Like, for example, I eat multi-grain bread. I'll eat the nine grain or the 12 grain and things like that. I don't Which is good. have any issues, but because I look at a lot of the fiber and stuff, and I think, I'll admit, I feel like I'm more of a slave to more of the fiber just to sort of feel fuller, longer, and there, there's other things that you can look at as well. Yeah, and then your white breads are going to be stripped of a lot of that good fiber that you need to clean out your system and to remove cholesterol. So once again, we got to go back to moderation is key and do what works for you. If you are of Asian lineage, whole wheats may not digest very well with you. If you are from a lineage of people that lived in a cold climate where they did not grow a lot of veggies and grains, whole wheat may not do very well for you. Let's turn that the other way. Maybe you're from a place where there's a lot of grains. Your ancestors ate a lot of greens. You may be able to process those things a lot better. So you want to find out what works for you for sure. Definitely. Do you feel that fish is a good food to help with memory? Mm, when you break it down, uh, yeah, definitely. First of all, you need protein to facilitate the energy and the building blocks that cause you to have good cognitive function. And you have the good fats, you know, your omega-3s, not so much the 6s, but you got your good omega fats to help you build good brain development, good connection with your brain, good uh, electrical connection. So, yeah. This is actually very good when you break it down and look at what it's made of. Very good for your brain. Very good. I haven't heard that in a long time. I remember they used to say eat fish for breakfast to improve your memory. I forgot all about that. I know that everybody's focused more on the hard health that fish can bring. And when I think about fish and memory and things like that, I go back to my time doing the Sports Jeopardy for three days in California. I was there at the studio. So they normally tape four episodes each day. In regular Jeopardy, they tape five episodes each day. And normally, okay. like Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday are shot before the lunch break. And then Thursday and Friday are shot after the lunch break. And you always see on Jeopardy, normally a champion gets dethroned on a Thursday or Friday show. It's the lunch break. Either the brain's going a little slower and things like that. Man, that is so interesting. You made me want to research that a little bit. And I knew that going in there, because if you watch A Week of Jeopardy, watch what happens the Thursday show. If somebody is running uh -huh. the table, let's say they've won five days in a row. They won Thursday to Wednesday. Watch the Thursday show if they're coming back playing a Thursday show. See what happens, and just who's a fresher person. I mean, and then again, you're playing all day, and you're at the podium. You're standing right. there. You don't really have a lot of time for breaks and things like that. Right. Coming in, I'll use my experience. Going to Sports Jeopardy, we came in, we came into the green room. They had all different types of snacks. They had donuts and fruits and things like that. Knowing that I want to have a clear mind, and that first day I didn't play until after the lunch break. So I took mm. a banana. I took some cheese sticks. I think I had an apple or so. I tried to avoid the donuts, and the donuts were really good. But stay. That ain't going to help you. I watched everybody play and things like that. Early on, they have you go out. They do a practice session. So you get up there, you'll play, you'll answer a couple questions. If you start getting hot, they pull you out of the rotation, put somebody else in, and then they keep doing that on and on and put you back in. But then what happens is lunch. I know I had a habit, and it was when I was playing Honda Campus All-Star Challenge. In the morning, we'd have a bunch of games. The biggest habit I had was I'd eat too much, and then I'd start feeling a little sluggish. So what yep. I tried to do... When I was doing the Sports Jeopardy thing, I went for lunch. Actually, this to me is a small lunch for me. And I'm not really a heavy eater. Only if you go to buffets. That's the only time I'm the heavy eater. So basically, I had a banana, a payday bar, a tea, a smart water. I had a salad with ham and cheese and dressing. I had a burger and I had something else. And again, to me, that was not too much. And that was in the afternoon. And I felt fine. And my first game that I played, the one I won, that was the show uh -huh. after the lunch break. I mean, there are huh. a whole bunch of things that factored into it. But that was show after the lunch break. Because, again, with something like Jeopardy, it's all about the questions. And your reflex time. Yeah. People forget it's all about reflexes. It's like an old West gunslinger who's got the quickest draw. And then even that, mm -hmm. it's about the response time. If you know the question or not, there's so many factors into it. But I always thought it was very, very interesting to look at a show after someone records a lunch break and see how they perform. Some people can oh, yeah. do it. That second day, I went through that whole day. First two shows before the lunch, had a lunch again. Second shows, ran the table that day. Had the mm -hmm. show. 
the next day. And I still ate the lunch the same way. I functioned well that same show. I felt I was a little slower reflex-wise on that show I lost. But still, I was at the point going into Final Jeopardy, I was leading. It's all about the mm-hmm. time, but I still felt, even when we were doing the tests and run-through again after lunch, I felt a little slow. It was like people were getting quick. But I was, mm-hmm. but once it came game time, I was fine, and the reflexes were sharp and, and things like that. It was pretty cool just to sort of notice that. And like I said, I only lost because of a poor wager and a question I thought I knew. So after you eat for an hour or two, your digestive system will use up to 20% of your energy. So that's why sometimes it's hard for people to eat and then go work out because they can't give 100 because their digestive system is using 20% of the energy. I think that's what you see going on with the Jeopardy. Everybody's energy is getting used to process these carbs and proteins instead of cognitive function. And I tried to eat too greasy stuff, not too heavy. Like I said, that's why I balanced it. If I'm going to get a burger, I balanced it out with a salad, too. In addition to eating yeah. a bunch of fruits, because it just felt like I know that worst time to have the itis is if you're on TV trying to, right. trying to win a bunch of money. So right. that was why I tried to at least eat a little better. After I got outside the studio, oh, I know, I threw down. I had Roscoe's chicken and waffles. I had Pink's hot dogs. <laughs> Coming into L.A., I got in and out <laughs> After the Dodgers game, got Jack in the Box. But yeah, I, I do. Okay. When I was going in, eat light, eat smart, no sugary mm-hmm. stuff. Because I know all those things you're predisposed to. Sugar crashes, blood going from your head to your stomach to help digest. And you get that brain fog going when you eat too many carbs, man. You get that brain fog going. Yeah, and that's, even then I didn't do that much bread. And like I said, the bread was on the burger and that was it. Right. Try to do all the healthier ways of eating. I know where I'm going. I'm not going to mess this up. If I'm going to lose, someone's going to beat me just because they knew more right. than me than opposed to be feeling. You followed the eat for energy concept. Yeah. And that's Instead of eating for taste, you ate for energy. Yeah. And it tasted good, too, for what it was at a commissary lunch. I didn't complain. It helped with the $40 <laughs> on one. So. Right. Well, that's interesting, man. Okay. Yeah, and that's the thing. If you get a chance, DVR like two weeks of Jeopardies. Because sometimes you're watching somebody, if somebody knocks someone off on the Thursday show, sometimes that Friday show, either they are sharp or they get knocked off by somebody else. And then that whole mm-hmm. pattern starts over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like people lose their edge when they get to the top as well. And that's the one thing, especially when it comes to like trivia and things like that. It's all about what you know. Cause, and it's like a hand of cards. Sometimes it's not your deck of questions. Other times right, yeah. Work, it's right into your wheelhouse. Right. This is true. That's why when you see a lot of people who know the arts and things like that, they'll avoid pop culture or they'll avoid sports. Like it's the right. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I think like that category where yeah. all these people knew nothing about the NFL and <laughs> every single question got wrong. Dang. Yeah, man. I feel like when it comes to knowledge, certain things, it's better to be well-rounded instead of having like a, a, a specialty. Uh, yeah. I know a little bit of science, a certain thing, but it's not like they're asking chemical formulas all the time. They're asking, like, this asteroid belt named after a specific person. I'm thinking, okay, right. I know Van Allen belt. Okay, good enough. The odds are nine out of ten times, that's the right question. Other times, that's going to be, uh, yeah. Either or. Like, if there is an example for where you're always going down to two answers, you're thinking it's either this one or that one. Like, for example, the answer could either be Lois Lane or Clark Kent. The thing is figuring out which one it is, because if you say Lois Lane is Clark Kent, it's frustrating. Or you say Clark Kent is Lois Lane. But it's impossible to memorize all of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No one can do that. It's just sort of things you pick up. I feel like if you have a particular specialty or goes in your wheelhouse, that's a big thing. That's where you want to stay. Oh, yeah. As we wrap up this interview, yeah, I'm glad to definitely have you back. What are some yeah, ways people can reach out to you and catch up with you on social media or throughout the World Wide Web? Yeah, man. The easiest way is just to find me on Facebook, Dante Finney, D-O-N-T-A, F-I-N-N-E-Y. That's the easiest way, man. A lot goes down in the DMs these days, so... You know, really just trying to make more relationships with people. You know, posting to the masses is cool, but I feel like it's easier for me to get my point across and for people to get their point across to me and to really let me know what they need just through the DMs, man. So hit me up with a message. Let's establish a real conversation and uh, go from there. Do you answer your Twitter more or more Facebook? Uh, Definitely more Facebook. I probably use Twitter the least. So it would be Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, then Twitter. Is it? You ever notice this? I especially, I think, going through journalism, I notice, of course, a lot of 
older reporters are using Twitter a lot more. But it seems like a lot of people in our age range, about 30 to 35 to maybe late 30s, early 40s, don't use Twitter as much as they would use Facebook or something along those lines. Right, yeah. Twitter has become the largest platform, but it's very specific. So... If you're big on sports, you know, to get your news and everything, it's huge to get on Twitter. But Facebook, I think, has more personal connection for a lot of people. You know, you got to find out what all these different mediums are for. Twitter is like a giant newspaper. Facebook is to make connections. Snapchat is kind of connect with the youth or give a quick message. And, you know, Instagram is purely visual, purely for your visual people. So you just got to find out. So with the older, you know, people that are older than us, they're more into the newspaper stuff, right? So they're going to be attracted to Twitter. Oh, yeah, definitely. I noticed as a reporter, I saw that you had a lot of parents who have ended up following you for specific things. Like, for example, I knew my highest peak of uh, followers were going to be if I was live at a game because I'm mm. going to give them the highlight. I'm going to give them that piece of news. If I can, I'll shoot a video to upload that as well. But right. Yeah, and that's how I felt like Twitter worked better that way. Not so much, I guess, sort of reaching out in, in other aspects, but... Yeah, so for that live game stuff, I would transition to Snapchat, my friend. I would give it a shot. Yeah. That's... Because people people go to Snapchat to see what's happening right now, this minute. How long do you get for a Snapchat story? Ten seconds. My son watches whole entire Sports Center episodes on Snapchat. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. He watches his Sports Center on Snapchat. Yeah, I just haven't really gotten into the whole Snapchat thing. But, I mean, it's one of those things. Hopefully, when the next social media trend comes out, the biggest thing is try to jump on that early because you never know. If I knew, Yeah, you never know. 2005, if I knew what I knew now, back then when everything started sort of hitting the forefront, YouTube and all that other stuff, I think it would make a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you something. YouTube and Twitter... It's going to take something huge to take those two giants down. It's going to take something huge. In other words, it's going to be a while. <laughs> it's going to be a while. Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, I can see them things canceling out. But YouTube is now, you might as well use, instead of saying Direct TV or saying Comcast, YouTube. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And I got Hulu now. So the only internet I have is Ryzen, but I got streaming with, with Hulu Live. and. Mm-hmm. And YouTube getting all kinds of uh, TV deals right now. The uh, follow-up to Karate Kid, Cobra Kai, YouTube exclusive. What did you think of that? Have you watched it? or what? Do you- yeah, it's awesome. I like it. I like it a lot. I'm glad that they kind of did that, man. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet, and I'm interested in watching that. And I may have to go through the Fire Stick and all the other routes to check it out. Yeah, if you got, if you got enough time, man, I would uh, definitely check it out. It's worth it. Okay, yeah, definitely check that out. Once again, I do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to participate in it. This is far from over. Like an old Charles Bronson thing, this is far from over. We're gonna, Far we're from gonna over, baby. This. Let's not wait. Let's get it. Oh, yeah. And the good thing is, pre-recording a lot yeah. of this stuff, best thing it helps to spread things out later on down the road because who knows what will happen. People get busy. And I also want to say congratulations <laughs> for you being a father for the third time. Yes, sir, man. We, we got lucky and got a baby girl coming along, so... That definitely has, for lack of a better term, thrown a wrench in some things, changed up the system a little bit. But uh, yeah, man, we love it, man. So thank you. Thank you a lot, Earl. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Actually, let me ask this one more question because you just recently became an uncle again, too, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Jeff became an uncle. Yeah. Yeah. There are six boys, six girls, including twins that are. Dang. Dang. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Actually, it made me think about this one question. Do you think there will be a time in the future where when it comes to parents having their children, they'll be able to pick their child's sex? The time is already here, my man. All they're waiting for is regulation. The time is already here. You can customize a complete entire human being right now. I mean, you can basically do anything. It's to the point where they even believe they could put wings in our back, put the wings up to our brain, and we could actually move them. Like, this is legit real science. Yeah. Yeah. And just the nervous system is a whole weird thing within itself. Look at my hand and watch my fingers. I just think of that scene in Terminator 2 where Joe Morton is fixing mechanical mm-hmm. fingers. Move. It just makes you think about how crazy the nervous system is and the human body is. Yeah, it's insane, man. So 
Yeah, you can definitely, that the time for that, customizing your baby is already here. And on that note, we'll wrap this show up. I really appreciate yeah. it. We'll do this again very soon. Yeah, we'll keep it going, man. Thank you for your patience. This is always good. Listen, guys, if you're not checking out Earl and his podcast, you're missing out some stuff, man. A lot of great entertainment, crazy random facts, and a lot of good local people. So if you're definitely from the Maryland Eastern Shore area, 100% check it out. And if you're not, and you're just trying to get a different view of a different place, a unique area, a lot of history, deep, rich in sports and knowledge and history all the way back to the Civil War, man. If you need to find out any of that stuff, Earl's your man. I'll put in one more nugget. You look at the Maryland flag. Those are the Catholic mm. family's two different coats of arms. Okay. See? Yeah. See? 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 Like the Red Cross, that is his mother's family, Lord Baltimore's mother's family. The black and gold that is on the father's side. Got you. Yeah, and the Confederate Marylanders used the cross, the red and white cross. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the Union used that one. Maryland is deep, man. We were right in the middle of it all, baby. Yeah. yeah. Literally. But I do appreciate it again. Thanks a lot. We'll do this again one more time. Yeah, no problem, sir. One more time. Shoot, we got 10 to 12 of these in us, buddy. Thank you, man.